What would happen to your behaviour if an illness damaged this part of your brain? Or what about if a metal rod went straight through the front part of your brain? Or how about if this part of your brain was completely removed? Hey everyone, welcome back to Bear It In Mind. In this video, we're going to explore localization of function in the brain, including the motor, somatosensory, visual, auditory, and language centers of the brain. At the end of the video, there'll be some retrieval practice of what we cover so that you can check your understanding. And you'll also find link below a free resource that goes with this video. In the 19th century, holistic theory was the dominant view of the brain at the time. This is the idea that all parts of the brain are involved in thought processes and action. However, the research of Paul Broca and Carl Wernicke led to a different theory, localization of function. This is the theory that different areas of the brain are responsible for different functions or behaviors. This would mean that if a particular part of the brain became damaged because of injury or illness, then the function associated with that area of the brain would also be affected. So here's your brain. The outer part of the brain is known as the cerebral cortex and contains four lobes, the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, the occipital lobe, and the temporal lobe. The frontal lobe is thought to be responsible for movement of the body, personality, and higher level thinking, such as concentration, planning, and problem solving. The motor area of the brain, motor meaning movement, is located at the back of the frontal lobe. The parietal lobe is thought to be involved with your senses, such as touch and pressure, taste, and body awareness. It is home to the brain's primary sensory area, a region where the brain interprets information from other areas of the body. The somatosensory area is located here, behind the motor area. Soma meaning body, and sensory meaning senses, so body senses. There is an important line you can probably make out between these two areas. This is called the central sulcus. It separates the frontal and parietal lobes, and more specifically, the motor area and the somatosensory area. The occipital lobe is thought to be responsible for sight, and so this is where the visual area is. The temporal lobe is thought to be responsible for receiving and processing sounds, and so this is where the auditory area is. So here's a daft way to try to remember what each of these areas do and where they are. Put your hand on your forehead. This is your frontal lobe, and your frontal lobe is responsible for movement and higher level thinking, such as concentrating, problem solving, and decision making. Then, take your fingers, put them on top of your head, and gently massage the top of your head. This is the parietal lobe, and is responsible for all your senses, like touch. This is where the somatosensory area is. Okay, so frontal lobe, movement, and higher level thinking. The parietal lobe, with senses. Okay do this. These are eyes in the back of your head. This is the occipital lobe responsible for vision. And lastly, take your hands, put them over your ears. Just kidding. This is the temporal lobe, which is responsible for hearing. I've had a number of students over the years who have walked out of their final exams only to come and tell me that they got asked a question about the brain and they found themselves doing silly things like this to try to remember where they all were and it worked. I hope that helps you too. Now, when it comes to the language centers in the brain, we find something even more interesting. Not only does the brain have different lobes, but the brain also has two hemispheres, a left and a right hemisphere. We will explore this further in another video on hemispheric lateralization, but for now, we can learn something interesting about localization of the brain in two famous cases of aphasia. Aphasia is the term given to someone who has lost the ability to understand or produce speech. There are two types of aphasia for you to be aware of. Firstly, Broca's aphasia. Paul Broca was a French physician and surgeon in the 19th century who specialized in the study of language. In April 1861, Paul Broca first met a man by the name of Louis Victor Le Bon. When Broca studied Le Bon, he found that regardless of the question asked him, he always responded tan tan. This is why throughout the hospital, he was known only by the name tan. Later that same month, patient tan died. Broca himself conducted the post-mortem exam on his brain, which revealed a large lesion in the left frontal lobe. A lesion is an area of the brain which has suffered damage through injury or disease. 
This discovery provides support for the idea of localization of function in the brain as it suggests that this area of the brain, referred to as Broca's area, is responsible for speech production. So if diagnosed with Broca's aphasia, this means they have an impaired ability to produce language and this is caused by damage in Broca's area. Secondly, Wernicke's aphasia. About 10 years later, Carl Wernicke identified patients who had no problems producing speech but were unable to comprehend language. They didn't understand it. When he examined the brains of these patients, he found lesions at a junction of the left temporal lobe, close to the junction with the parietal and occipital lobes. This area of the brain has become known as Wernicke's area. It's associated with the understanding of spoken and written language, further demonstrating how the brain may be localised for function. So, if diagnosed with Wernicke's aphasia, this means they have an impaired ability to comprehend language and this is caused by damage to Wernicke's area. However, research by Dronkers et al. in 2007 has raised questions about Broca's area. This is because they conducted an MRI scan on patient Tan's brain. Now, you may be thinking, how in the world did they study patient Tan's brain in 2007 when he died in 1861? Well, Broca made the decision when he carried out the post-mortem not to dissect the brain of patient Tan, but to preserve it in alcohol, where it was placed in a Paris museum for future generations to see. As a result of advances in technology, patient Tan's brain was later scanned with an MRI machine. These higher resolution images showed that other areas of the brain were also damaged and therefore may have been involved in his failure to produce speech beyond simply Broca's area. Therefore, these findings raise questions about localization of function of the brain, particularly for language, and suggest that a more holistic understanding is needed where other areas of the brain are involved. From cases of aphasia to a famous case of amnesia. Other supporting research comes from one of the most famous and studied individuals in the history of psychology, a man known as Patient H.M. His real name was Henry Malayason. During his childhood, H.M. had been involved in a bicycle accident, which resulted in H.M. developing epilepsy. Many of the seizures he experienced worsened to the point where medication was having little impact and left him with the option of surgery. However, when H.M. had specific parts of his brain removed, including the hippocampus, whilst it helped reduce his seizures, it left him with problems with his memory. H.M. was unable to form any new long-term memories. He could remember things before the surgery, but couldn't form memories after the surgery. His short-term memory was fine, but he couldn't transfer any of this information to long-term memory. The case study of H.M. provides further support for localization of function in the brain, with the hippocampus thought to be responsible for learning and memory, specifically long-term memory. For a final piece of evidence, Phineas Gage was working on the building of a railroad when explosives went off and an iron rod a metre long went through his left cheek, up through his left eye and out of his skull on the top of his head. This iron rod left him with significant damage to parts of his left frontal lobe. Phineas Gage survived the incident amazingly, but he was never the same. It was reported that this normally calm and reserved man now showed a different set of personality characteristics, often lacking social inhibition. In other words, he behaved in ways that were considered to be inappropriate. He seemed to lack a level of self-control, to the point that his friends and acquaintances said he was no longer Gage. This led to the suggestion that the frontal lobe of the brain is thought to be involved with our personality and specifically with emotional processing and decision making. However, as you may have noticed, all of the evidence considered so far has involved rare and unusual cases of individuals. This is a problem because it raises questions about the extent to which the findings from such small samples can be applied to the wider population. Therefore, it could be argued we should be cautious about localization of function in the brain if the evidence supporting it lacks generalizability. Finally, a strong argument against the idea of localization of function is brain plasticity. Brain plasticity refers to the brain's ability to change and adapt as a result of experiences. Some people who have lost abilities and functions because of the brain becoming damaged, whether that's due to an accident or an illness, have then recovered these functions later on because the brain has changed. For example, when someone has a stroke, they now have damaged brain tissue which can no longer carry out the functions it did before. 
Instead, what can happen is the healthy areas surrounding that part of the brain can compensate and develop new functions. The brain rewires and reorganizes itself. Therefore, it could be argued that the brain is more holistic than localized for function because the location of a function does not have to be fixed to a certain part of the brain. Now, just before we go on to test ourselves, in the next video, we're going to explore the hemispheres of the brain. Does the left side of the brain do something the right side doesn't? And as part of that, we're going to explore split brain research. These are people who have the two halves of their brain separated. If instead you wanted to explore the idea of brain plasticity first, and see the brain's amazing ability to change and recover after trauma, you can click that video on the screen or link below. But now it's time to check your understanding of what we covered in this video. I'll present one question at a time, you can pause the video to answer it yourself first and then press play again to reveal the answer.